Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne az. But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello. Hello and welcome to Barn Block. This is uh, day five of me having COVID, um, and so I have been locked up in my town. Sorry, we were having audio issues there for a second. I am still pretty sick, although a little better. Um, what you were getting was residual audio from uh, another podcast. So how are you guys doing? Um, I have a lot to cover today, and I'm a little tired because I just got off the phone with my publisher, but that's about good news. My second poetry collection, uh, Liberation, All That Bright, etc., is coming out from Mysterio Show Press. And eventually, once COVID subsides a little bit, I'll be doing some stuff in New York, um, some other places about it. <laughs> I'll also be giving interviews and promoting all their authors and the publisher of the press, Terry Tapp, a pretty good friend of mine. Terry and I share um, a similar worldview in that we're both radicals who were born into the working class but became highly educated. Um, we also know that one of the, the key features of being a good radical is knowing how to change your class habitus, which is a very fancy way of knowing how to talk to people so you're not belittling them. You don't talk to people like they're younger, stupider, or dumber than you. And this is one of the most frustrating things I often deal with with the left is because often when they aim at a popular audience, what they're actually doing is talking down and betraying their own class origins. Now, class origins aren't the most important thing about you, and leftists often make way too much hay about class origin, but they do explain the way people talk, and it takes a little bit of emotional intelligence and a little bit of moving in classes other than, you, other than your own to know how this would actually be perceived by other people. This is not any small matter, because a lot of times leftists do not get why people don't care about the things they care about or why certain things are offensive. Now, this relates to the topic of uh, the conversation today because it goes back to the problems with a lot of the critiques of Joe Rogan. But I want to acknowledge that there's some stuff that's come out um, that made some of yesterday's commentary about Joe Rogan and race make a little bit more sense. After all, we know that not just interviews that Joe Rogan did with Alex Jones, but interviews that Joe Rogan did with a bunch of different people were pulled from the Spotify playlist, about 70 of them. And one of them contains Joe Rogan comparing a neighborhood, I believe, in Philadelphia to Planet of the Apes. And then there's a video of him apologizing for it and saying his own commentary was racist. Now, It is impossible to know how sincere any such apology ever is. But we already know this. 
and and this is another thing that we have to deal with. The issue is, though, those 70 or so episodes aren't readily available. Combing them for uh, and combing other Joe Rogan, this or that, and other, to find the most problematic episodes aren't going to convince the uncommitted, generally, of his current positions being that kind of toxic. This is not to defend Joe Rogan. I never have. Like I've said all the time, one of the problems with the media industry is it has low bar anyway. And censoring it would also just mean to the silencing of most voices because it would encourage the legal departments to take the most censorious line to avoid lawsuit. In many ways, it would just be more honest for people to admit that they are just pro-censorship by the government. Not that I am, nor do I think that Marxists historically should be. After all, Marxist writing clear as... Uh, if you've read the five volumes of Hal Draper's Marx's theory, Mark, Karl Marx and Theory of Revolution, I think that's what that's called. It's a long book, basically, it trajectories his writings and career uh, before we had all the MAGA work, anyway. That was Marx's first serious non academic writing, was on, the, was on the topic of free speech. There, however, are contradictory statements, uh, seemingly about the nature of speech and a bourgeois free speech in things like Engels, which is why Lenin, which is what Lenin used to justify his curtailing of speech himself. Lenin is also inconsistent on this point, and I know people don't like me pointing that out. But people exist in their time and context, and consistency is not a trait that people often have. However, the problem with this, and I remember when I argued with Doug Lane about this 20... Uh, in 2015, I believe, was not was not the same as Doug. Doug defended it on the absolute principle, where I was like, fine, I grant you the absolute principle, but my problem is also it doesn't actually work. After all, censoring Alex Jones has not actually really even totally curtailed his audience. It has curtailed it somewhat, but that's why he wants it back. But it is a narrative that people can use to actually increase their audience and increase their feelings of being the underdog while they're literally millionaires. After all, there are a few things more persuasive, not just to the American mind, but to the mind in general, as people in power don't want you to hear this. It always makes it more attractive and sexy. Furthermore, it often leads to the kind of siloing that people often have. And let's be honest, most of these people who talk about on the left are objectively either the children of upper middle class people from professional backgrounds, or they are those upper middle class people from professional backgrounds. And the leftification of their politics largely coincides with either opposition to Trump or opposition to their declining status as that middle class gets sucked away. This is the same thing that is also driving right-wing politics, as I've said yesterday. The petite bourgeois seeing their profit margins fall is driving their reaction. The tax has actually hurt them. When someone says, well, when's the last time the Democrats raised federal taxes? They have a point, but then they don't look at the different tax rates between the states. After all, democratic states like Pennsylvania, which is not even that democratic anymore, but historically had stuff like local income tax. The levels of taxation multiply dramatically, and this is not bracketed in most discussions, even by liberals, of American taxation law. And furthermore, this makes sense, because while these while the states do not have currency sovereignty and thus cannot inflate or deflate their purchasing power, nor in the case of some economies like California would they want to, um, it becomes very clear that without government loans and bonds, they have to operate either at a balanced budget or, or, or uh, at a balanced budget, or they have to operate 
uh, reconciling their bonds within a certain number of years. Um, if they if they eventually cannot do that, they usually have to default, which we've had now in 2007, which we forget. Which means that tax, taxation at the local level actually funds most of the services that people care about. And the federal dollars usually only aid on margin. Look at the percentage of the school budget that comes from local uh, municipal and federal uh, uh, versus federal taxes. Yes, the schools can't afford to lose that money, but it's not a huge amount of money. Now, I say all this to point out that this focus on federal politics and this focus on all this is not just localism. It is also um, it is also to point out that um, you don't build something from nothing. And when you can't deliver on something, often these defensive political moves um, become a way to feel like you have activity, emotion, that you're doing something, but it's actually a conservatizing force. And since you're not looking at the way the finances and everything actually works in the United States, because you're only looking at one level of it, you can't even begin to provide what it would take to build a national movement. The focus on the executive by, the, by social democrats was always, as I said, misguided. It showed a fundamental misunderstanding of even executive privilege and a dip into an almost Bonapartism. After all, what could Bernie do without having his party at his back? And the idea that just because he became the executive, the party would be at his back even misses the fact that that wasn't even true for Trump. Trump successful planks were planks that were already believed by the Republican Party, or they were things that were in the executive purview, such as immigration and war policy, and the ability to set administrative tariffs, ironically meaning that Trump's very battle with the deep state was often dependent on the, on the administrative fiat within the presidency of said deep state. But people don't want to look at that, not objectively, because it means that their own strategies are unlikely to work. Which brings me back to the Joe Rogan scenario. There are real things to critique about the Joe Rogan scenario versus, say, the Whoopi Goldberg scenario. For example, Whoopi did say something that is wrong in the fact that she read current notions of American biological race back onto German notions of biological race 100 years ago. As if that was clarifying. No, the Germans did not see the Jews as white. Also, whiteness wasn't what they were fighting over. The expansive category of whiteness, as opposed to, say, Aryanness, um, was something that was more useful to set up colonial states than to a country that was literally trying to do a central colonial project on Eastern Europe by depopulation, depopulating the Slavs. Let's be real here. But Whoopi's mistake is no more mistake, no more mistake than the average American, except that she did it about, about um, the one historical atrocity that almost all Americans know about, which is the Holocaust. Or the Shoahs. I, as a person, like to say in respect to my own background. Now, the thing is, will this help Whoopi? Probably not. Whoopi's been censored before, and who cares about who's on The View? Um, but there is, yes, a total hypocrisy in the general response to that, and it's fair to point that out. Not because one should maybe want to censor Joe Rogan, but because one should point out that there is a double standard at play, not just on who's doing the attacking, but whom they are attacking. Now, I say all this, though, because 
this whole discourse is really contained to hyper-educated people and people who are maybe not hyper-educated but highly pushed into Twitter. And while Twitter is one of the most used platforms for public intellectuals and people pushing media because it doesn't censor and doesn't pay for play in the same way that Facebook has done as Facebook as begins to collapse from said policies now, which is actually kind of refreshing. Um, it is also one of the least used social media networks worldwide. The people in it are selected for a certain kind of person. The highly connected, the people who view politics or whatever as sports. Now, there are responsible ways to use Twitter, right? While I generally agree with Mitch Richard Sinmore's treating machine, I will point out that there are healthy discourses on Twitter. Right? The problem is not the medium. Exactly. The problem is the incentives around the medium encourage bad behavior for certain kinds of interactions, but not others. It encourages toxic behavior amongst fandoms, too. But the elephant in the room about all this is that while I have never subscribed to the PMC thesis because I think it is ideologically co incoherent, people have taken that to me to say that like the left is largely working class or whatever. And then they move the bar around by what working class means. And after all, in Marxism, this is never defined. Famously, the last chapter of Capital ends off before the definition. Furthermore, the dialectical method used historically doesn't set terms. The terms are set through the debate itself. And in the Marxism, the debate is literally the unfolding of history. After all, that's the innovation that Hegel adds to dialectics. Historically speaking, dialectics is a dialogic process where one is opposed to the other side and comes to the meaning of terms read all your platonic dialogues they are dialectical forms of reasoning but what hegel does is not just his you know sublation you know afibum versus thesis and antithesis which is actually more kant and fichte than hegel anyway what hegel does is put this as a process evolving in history it makes history the argument because Hegel believes that the ideas are manifested in the world. Now, Marxists say, fine, but they flip it. And by this is what we mean by that. Ideas emerge from the world. They are reflections of the material world. That is what the difference is. Don't let people confuse you with sophistic arguments about this flipping. Most people can't even explain to you what is going on or how the philosophical changes have come. But this means that when I talk about, say, the PMC, we do have to take some Berduian notions of class and really look at them. The habitats of people are different. Why is it, for example, that China, who will renegotiate loans at very favorable terms um, for, uh, say, African or South Asian nations, even though they make that process completely opaque and do not even allow people to look at the actual terms. And if you don't believe me, you should really read the China and Africa project on this. Why is that received so much better than the West not doing favorable terms of being renegotiated, but but occasionally being willing to completely drop loans when people are like, well, the West never did. Yes, it does. All right. But it does it as charity. And the thing is, when you do something as charity, and when you talk to people as charity, you are putting them in a position beneath you, which is the last thing anyone in, in a subjugated position would actually want, be it a nation or be it an individual. This is also why liberal activism in regards to, and, and frankly, a lot of left activism in regards to working class is rejected because it comes off as parochial. Don't talk down to people. I say this as a person who condescends to everyone. But at least I do it equally. It's not a class trait with me. It's a personality flaw on my part. Ideas do not equal the superstructure. This is a misguided and misreading of Marx because ideas are related to even the relations of production, which are very much part of the base. Most of you, frankly, have a very vulgar notion of Marx that is based off of a few metaphors because you haven't read it all. 
and fine. Historically speaking, most Marxists haven't read it all. Orthodox Marxism was not was was codified in a time where no one could read it all. Social relations of production, you know, uh, are not just about the superstructure. I mean, like Miles is saying, uh, Miles Roach here is saying something that isn't totally wrong, but don't don't be so reductive about it. Ideas are not all about the superstructure, right? One of the flaws that I have, yeah. One of the flaws that you have to deal with is that Marx really didn't deal with the privatization or social distribution of knowledge. And then when people did try to deal with it, such as uh, Lukash's attempt and standpoint, they did so in a totally heroic narrative that was really flattering towards the working class, but also made Marxism even more incoherent. The means of mental production is how you understand and shape the world. This is why, as a as I take a nominalist stance to this, all right? A nominalist means that I think that concepts emerge from the world, that human beings don't make them up from nothing. However, they don't have in and of themselves any inherent meaning. Furthermore, most of you have a somewhat simplistic view of how all this works. And let's go into this a little bit today. For example, um, do you think QAnon got, LARP got, out of hand, got out of control or was a sophisticated psyop to compose the subject narrative and send people down a false rabbit hole? There's no evidence that it is a sophisticated psyop. However, Right, exactly. I'm going to flash this on you and read this for you. Marxism, dadism, you, you get it. <sighs> Ideas, languages that are, have a material basis and actually existing social relations, but also reinforce them. Base superstructure is a neat metaphor for that, but it's also just a metaphor. And also remember, in the base superstructure, it is a feedback loop. One is not totally determinative of the other. But let's look at something like the QAnon phenomenon before I get back to my original point. Was QAnon probably a sophisticated site? Uh, probably not. It doesn't matter for it to be a sophisticated site. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, uh, my friend Amy Keefe is here talking about Russiagate in simplistic terms. Why won't left the rest attack Russiagate? Well, which left? The Democratic Party left or the far left? Because there's plenty of people in the far left that attacked Russiagate. There's plenty of people who use it to promote a simplistic notion that Russia isn't doing anything, whereas that doesn't make sense either. Russia is simply trying to expand and, and negotiate its own economic sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. It's just trying to do what it sees a great power is doing. The whole PSL was devoted to this. There's even articles in Jacobin about how Russiagate was stupid. You just don't read it. Or you only listen to people who selectively criticize the left because you're fucking reactionary, Keith. And don't pretend like you're not. Now, this is personal here. For people who are listening. Well, a lot of your friends live in California. <laughs> I mean, let's think about the habitats of where they come from. Of course, they're not going to look at it. It's convenient for them. It's a good scapegoat, right? And there's just there's just a sliver of truth to some bad actors coming out of Eastern Europe messing with the United States. And now they don't want to drop it. Yeah, you're right. It's embarrassing. It's utterly embarrassing. For those of us who never believed all of it or most of it, like the Steele dossier, why isn't why aren't you seeing? I mean, even like the fucking New York, uh, Washington Post has debunked the Steele dossier, and why won't leftists go up and earn it? Well, for one, it's a liberal talking point. Okay, fine, but another, we have to deal with the fact that a whole lot of people 
on the liberal left and even people adjacent to them didn't want to look at the fact that there was no good evidence for that and that it wasn't going to be released. It was basically a publicity stunt that who people who were wedded to the Democratic Party. Now, in so much that the left refuses to, to, to point out that the Democratic Party is utterly bankrupt and that any even the attempts to do it by leftists uh, have been largely unsuccessful, that is a big problem. Cannot be denied either. Now, here's the problem, uh, Miles Roach. This is also a bad approach. You don't invert a lie by assuming that the opposite thing is true. This is not sound thinking. What you have to do is look at why people would pu push certain things. Remember, a truth that is unfortunate can drive a lie a lot better than a lie than a pure lie can. All right. And that's the issue with Russiagate. Yeah, I know, but and that's the issue with Russiagate. Is if you were looking at it and you like looked at hackers or Cambridge Analytica, you could find enough things that indicated that there were some bad faith actors, although they were never tied to the Russian government. Um, not with any evidence that I've seen, that were acting in U.S. elections, but you can't find any evidence that it actually made a difference. Furthermore, you should assume that these are going on all the time between bourgeois powers because that's what bourgeois powers do. It is even true between like Israel and the United States or Germany and the United States. Someone who talks about the PMC as a class could not go off about people moralizing by calling names by picking an incoherent category. And then you say, well, you know them when you see them. Well, people know a lot of things when they see them. Here's how you know that social breakdown is happening. And ironically, the person who was best on this was actually Tucker Carlson 15 years ago. Let's, let's be honest. Conspiracy propaganda propagates when there's high social disunity. And there's high social disunity when both elites are no longer competent enough to run things. And there's no class base to counteract it, which there is not in the Middle East. Tucker actually understands this, which explains a lot of what he does. By accepting this narrative, instead of trying to play to get it like he did at the end of the Iraq war, he's just decided to play to play part in it. And sometimes, and a lot of times, let's be honest, what he hits on the left on is stuff that's true, which is why his audience is even growing amongst people who identify as Democrats. Whereas someone like Rachel Maddow, as is being brought up, is, have never considered a leftist of any import, but was toying off about Russiagate in ways that were trying to discredit every electoral candidacy that didn't go her way. I mean, look at Georgia. Well, there's lots of fishy things about Georgia. She tried to tie Kemp to Russiagate, which is absurd. And yet, this had play amongst a lot of Democrat adjacent activists, and a lot of the left can't decide where they're going to stand on this, as, as they have come from backgrounds that have largely trusted these sources for 20 years or more. They come out of this media sphere. One that looked like it was counter to the narrative of the Bush administration, but has long since been commercialized and sanctified. And if you were to watch your news from MSNBC, you were just as likely to be wrong about the reality of the world as watching your news from Fox. But this is more of the point, and I'm not going to let people get, continue to distract me on this. When there's no movement on these issues, what are you going to throw up? You're going to throw up some cultural war bullshit. This was a right-wing tactic, actually, for a long, long time, and they were better at it than we are. And the structural reasons why it works for them better than it would work for us. Cultural war battles 
um, are about maintaining an element of the status quo. And what people cannot look at is the liberal status quo contains both the conservative and the liberal elements already. Capitalism is not, is, you know, needs excluded others. Sometimes that excluded others does not need to be racial. Right? It can be national. It can be, it can, it can be the former oligarchs even. We've seen that plenty of time in the development of capital in the third world as in the developing world. The third world is actually the wrong way to talk about it. Furthermore, these identities are thin and they have their own class distinctions between them. There is a fundamental truth that, that for example, I was talking to someone about this today. You know, you might find uh, an MFA from a immigrant gay latinx person who's publishing a very interesting book and this is you know good that it's being published but if you look at their background a lot of times while they've gone through literal suffering or whatever um uh that they 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 had a lot of benefits before they came to the United States. Very rarely do you find people who are well-off immigrants to the U.S., even if they went through severe poverty when they came to the U.S., who come from that background, right? Unless they're refugees. Like, for example, uh, Somalians and Ethiopians and Eritreans in the United States, as opposed to Nigerians, Right. These are something you have to look at when you look at these these backgrounds. Our, I was talking about Punjabi immigrants to to Canada, which are highly proletarianized and often in like trucking versus Punjabi Im, uh, immigrants to the United States because the rules are different and who can come in. And so, uh, Punjabi immigrants to the United States had a lot more money before they came here, so they tend to actually be in the upper classes of U.S. society even now. Um, that's not true in Canada, where the rules are different. Right, you're literally dealing with a different class of people under the same identity, and I only say this because it literally came up in conversation yesterday. So, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? This cultural war stuff, however, does tend to favor people who are who are more explicit about favoring parts of the status quo. And leftists are supposed to be against that. But as I've said over and over and over again, they've ceded this, this uh, terrain almost solely to the right, who are fighting for a different part of the status quo, but one that is increasingly on the losing end of the status quo stick. The petit bourgeois, economically, are never a stable formation. They're easily proletarianized. Many of them make less money than even normal working class people. A lot of them, the ones who tend to vote for Trump, are in this, are in this true middle class wealth category, but between eighty and $200,000 a year. Like, if you live with a family of four, that's not a lot of money. It's also not nothing, though, and it still puts you in this top 20% of income owners. And the working class's immediate interest is going to be in the interest of whichever bourgeoisie is dominated in their area. Hence why working class voting patterns, if you get anyone to vote, and remember most working class people don't, even in high election years, what you get is something that reflects the economic interest of the immediate area. It reinforces the status quo because the status quo existing will at least put food on the table. And unless you can offer something real other than the moral high ground of being right, um, that's the way people are going to flow. Now, I bring this up because this even applies to minority politics. 
I was listening to 538 again. I keep on bringing this up because it's increasingly a better source for news than left shit. The immigration question has largely been what has kept uh, the Latino voting bloc um, wedded to the Democrats. But you know what? That's not working anymore. And why is it not working? Because it is perfectly clear that Biden's going to replicate almost all the Trump policies, but is going to create a crisis in the initial thing by seeming not to replicate those policies. That's exacerbating tensions at the border. It's actually a perfect storm of bad decisions. And it makes no one happy. Not the people who want border reform, not the people who want to abolish borders, but also not the people who want to strengthen borders. No one is made happy by this by this the thing. And you might go, oh, it's Latinos like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, which is fair enough. Right? You can talk about the Guazana vote, but the, every indicator says it is no longer limited to that. South Texas is an indicator like this. Even the Chicano vote is beginning to spiral off. You also have more and more non-Venezuelan and non-Cuban Latin people who are no longer identifying as Latinos or Chicanos, but as white. Yeah. Neoliberal robot news for neoliberal robots are whatever post-neoliberalism is going to become, but it, it's just like reading stock reports. You get better information from it. I can't emphasize this enough. So what does that tell you? It also, the left narrative about racism here totally has left the fact that racial tensions and bigotry exist amongst all racial groups. And that this has come out more and more under the auspices of local politics, particularly in Democratic and city primaries, in ways that, um, frankly, mean that, for example, anti-immigrant sentiment uh, can be inflamed amongst ADOS voters, uh, African descendants of slaves only, and anti-black um, sentiment and colorism can be inflamed amongst certain categories of Latino v voters pretty easily. If you view the world in simplistic identity categories, you don't even understand the way these identity categories function. And oh my God, when you start applying it outside of the United States, what does it do? Ask yourself all these questions when you see people going after Joe Rogan and think, why are we doing this? And what is a conservatizing factor? Now, I can call my friend a reactionary here in front of me, but there is a real sense in which um, I'm going to give, for people who aren't watching this and also seeing my interaction, I'm, get, I'm talking to an old friend of mine who's in the chat. Um, I'm going to give him credit, though, in telling me to take seriously the moral psychology standpoints of people like Jonathan Haidt, who, you know, uh, and uh, other people who are into moral tribalism theory, while their theory doesn't really explain why different societies have different politics when they claim it's trans-historical and trans-social, meaning that they're not being nominalist in terms of their words, they do find some key findings that I find fascinating that actually explain actual interactions a lot better. Let me give you an example. Um, culture war stuff for the left has increasingly become a defensive position where you double down on elements of the status quo. How is that not structurally conservative? Well, it makes sense because they're also, uh, in most areas of, of, of play, progressives are losing. While Democrats as a whole... Uh, apparently in January did slightly better on generic ballot than Republicans once people started seeing Republicans double down on January 6th shit for the benefit of their base. Progressives are the least popular political faction in the United States and the least identified with. According to recent Pew polls done about the same time as this generic ballot poll, they only make up 6% of the population. And they are by far actually the whitest category even more than god and god's conservatives which are the next whitest category so the polar opposite extremes 
are represented by exactly who you think they would be represented by, by the way, when you look at their income status and the parts of, of the world that they belong in. Progressives tend to live in the richest cities in the United States. Well, they don't tend to be the richest people in those cities. That is where they come from. Also, the hot bourgeoisie has the money to live in those areas and get the social benefits of that social network that's, that's provided by liberal states, but also not really lose out under the taxation regime because they have the money to deal with it. So when you're defending the status quo, you're actually taking a conservative move. Hence why increasingly doubling down on things that we generally assume assumed were parts of the conservative war on terror and the aughts, calling everything terrorism. A category that is vague and nebulous and applies to, even under its legal definition, many, many things, depending on what you interpret as a political action. Um, another example of this would be calling for deplatforming and censorship instead of being able to offer another platform. And the reason why people like Jon Stewart, as obnoxious liberal as he is, call this out is functionally they know that it's a losing game. It literally works less and less over the past 10 years, which is why more and more large media spaces who are generally seen as somewhat liberal are willing to engage in this provocation because they want to have it both ways. Someone's like, in PR and the PR use of race, the last census uh, had a sharp jump in people who self categorize as something other than white, uh, which used to be the vast majority, which is true. Um, part of that's birth rates. But that same, uh, the same research actually indicates that um, recent immigrants from Latin America, um, second generation immigrants, are increasingly identifying as white. Um, and also, there are a lot of people who would traditionally be considered white who want to distance themselves from that. Um, so this is something you have to look at. And when you parse all these numbers, they change and they're fluid. They are effectively socially constructed categories and as socially constructed categories, they move around. But most people in America, as much as they talk about the social construction of race, also use race as an essentialist totem, as if it meant anything. It's like the way Twitter people would call someone a settler in, in a way that made no sense. This makes people uncomfortable because a lot of the people committed to progressive causes really just believe fundamentally in their bones that people share their class background or whatever, maybe because they grew up poor, maybe because they grew up in another country, maybe because they were very lucky and were able to climb up out of the rafters. I know plenty of people who are upper middle class who come from like Colombia or Venezuela or wherever. This is something that means that this way of regulating politics is going to break down, ironically, as the the, the whole... I had an argument with my friend, Professor Alan G., and I'm going to use his name because he's big on this. He would always talk about 2050, a year that America is no longer majority white. And I was like, hey, it, may, it may even happen earlier than that, mate. Then I was, but then what I would say to him, and I was like, but you, the idea that this will lead to a liberal post-white utopia seems maddening to me because what that would actually indicate is the spectrum of political opinion amongst, quote, non-whites, unquote, would actually start to resemble the spectrum of political opinion amongst white people. If they were more fully integrated into the United States system, then effectively it would indicate that their politics would start being driven more by immediate interest concerns. And as immediate interest concerns are no longer racialized, they will start looking a lot more like class grounds, which is exactly what we see, actually. Furthermore, the left doesn't seem to understand this because they come from a downwardly mobile middle class. Many of whom were even, the, you know, children of like people who themselves were upwardly mobile who actually did, during the post-war social contract, move up from the 
industrial working class and to other more white collar stratas of what would be the non-industrial working class. And since the definition of these things move all around, it become clear that they invested tons of money into their children having resources and going to college only to see them down and mobile, but also intermixing with people who come from a higher strata of that class stratosphere, which is why, like I've always thought the PMC question doesn't really get to the point of these distinctions, but this is not a here nor there. What we can say is we have a left that is ar largely focused in idealistic terms from people who are downwardly mobile and young. And as they be, and we've seen this with millennials actually, and this should not be understated, as they start to get their wealth, this politics starts to dissipate. If people are given an opportunity to sell out, they generally will. Historically speaking, by the way, being a leftist actually provided material gains. I mean, even if you look at someone like a radical anarchist like Malatesta, they were literally doing Robin Hood stuff. They were robbing banks and spreading the wealth around, which is not anything anybody would can even can. It's not even something people can do anymore. Right? The world of that romantic illegalism is closed off to you because the stakes are so much higher and surveillance systems so much more adept. The integration of capitalism with the state, ironically, at the very time period in which it was seeming to deny borders, actually increased. After all, people don't get, and I know plenty of liberals is like, well, privacy is just a historical thing that only existed. And I'm like, you don't understand what privacy was for. What I consider progressive and some left positions on the environment and cultural uh, and, and climate change is cultural because they focus depends on how they focus on it. If your focus on climate change is solely consumption, then yes, it's a cultural war issue because you can't do anything about that. And frankly, let's look at the way this this is rewarded in the economics of it. Let's take a product like Dr. Bonner's Castile soap, right? They 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 have ethical um, quote ethical uh distribution of pay they do uh, their owner only makes like uh it actually follows the rule that like ben and jerry's used to say they follow where they start off paying someone about 22 dollars an hour and the executive only makes like five times that so about 150 fine they source everything ethically but that means that the cost of this product is passed on the consumer so the only people who have the conscience to buy this consumer this ethical and very quality product are upper middle class people because most people can't pay $10 for a vat of soap. Which means this, that this becomes literally, and, and, and this is a conservative critique that is true, becomes a value signaling for a certain class of people who have the luxury to have that value signal. And for all the talk, well, yeah, poor people can live on a vegan diet. Yeah, they can, but what are you going to do to do that? How are you going to make that uh, more viable? What are you going to do? If you really want people to live this, and how you're going to make that cheaper, you can't do it in the capitalism. Similarly, with all this police defunding talk, and defunding was always a non-starter with the communities of color, by the way, because they've seen the police defunded before. It happened in the early 90s. I have too. That's not the same as police reorganization or police abolition. They're not remotely the same. Furthermore, to do policing in a more humane way actually costs money. Bullets, on the grand scale of the federal government, are cheaper than labor. Just going to put that out. So yes, these become cultural war habits. And yes, these are things in which the upper middle class leftists can win on because they have the ability to do it. But let's look at the broader culture war. Historically speaking, the culture war has not favored the right, believe it or not. All right. But this leads me to the second part of what I want to discuss today, which is the legal defensiveness of the left and its actual increasing dependence on a court system that was not designed to help it because of a fluke 
of the Supreme Court in the 1960s. What do I mean by that? Historically speaking, the current the current trajectory of the Supreme Court is actually more like its normal historical function. Plus, lower courts right now are actually shutting down labor uh, actions all over the country. The courts and the governor in in uh, in Maine actually stopped the unionization of certain workers. Just outright stopped it. Um. There have been attempts, that, but courts have to make uh, people take bad contract negotiations. And again, I haven't really s- seen this talked about. And while they were overturned legally and on appeal, which weren't picked up by some people who were talking about it, the fact that anyone would have the gall to allow it is pretty amazing. Furthermore, um, just this week, people who've been trying to organize and, and like well race stuff uh, against working conditions, not pay, but like uh, sick out policies have been told by the feds or by, but not by the feds, by judges that they can't do it and just accepted it. Why would people think that you can rely on these courts for federal labor protections, particularly in moments where you really needed to? The only time they would side with labor is when, is when things are actually going well. Yeah, main, the main governor did that. Yes. Sorry, not the courts. Uh, but the courts did it in three other instances in the last year. You're going to protest court decisions? Okay, what are you going to do? Historically speaking, by the way, during the high importance of labor, people just ignored the court decisions and they had the guns to back it up. Just going to point that out to you. That's what they did. And when local law enforcement wouldn't wouldn't affect it, which usually they would, but sometimes they wouldn't. Again, the historical examples like the mine wars in West Virginia. What would actually happen um, was that either the federal government would be called in, or they would bring in private security forces like Pinkertons and Baldwin men. But you can't do that if you're totally de- if you're totally dependent on NGO and uh, and frankly former labor unions because it would cost the the labor union status in this scenario. Someone says we're the most armed working class in the world. Yeah, but you're not you're not unified and and people are afraid of losing their legal status and their incorporation into former labor by doing it. The high point of American unionization was actually when unions were illegal. And the second high point was when they were incorporated into the apparatus of the state because there was enough, there was literally enough uh, wealth um, surplus in the United States because of the results of World War II that people could be pretty generous about it. This is certain Peter Turchin turns out he calls it the American, you know, backdoor social democracy. But what he misses is this was all in the context of World War II. And the only reason that wealth was here and not diffuse elsewhere, was the destruction of world wealth elsewhere. And that was also why we were able to give good terms to the Mid-Atlantic when we shifted to stuff like uh, off the dollar. Michael Hudson talks about this and misses the probability point, but then points out that we are no longer giving good terms to Europe, which is increasingly why they turn to places like Russia. Why aren't we giving good terms to them anymore? Because we don't have the capacity to do it. There's We don't have the productive capacity to do it. We can only do it by IOUs of of uh of of u.s currency which we back with the military all right this is why i talk about mmt as being solely an, an imperial project right now it is not that modern monetary theory would not be useful in other scenarios but it's that you have to back everything you do up not with currency currency is a mystification all marxists know that and if you don't you need to grow up Currency isn't the important thing. It's your productive capacity, your ability to actually build the society in which you live in. In the U.S., while it's still the third, uh, the second or third most productive economy, depending on the year, can't really compete with that anymore. It just can't. 
uh, is Europe going to pick China over it? Well, the thing is, China also is dependent on the U.S. The idea that the U.S. and China are completely separate in this is just not true, right? The problem is uh, China doesn't want to be the reserve currency. It would open it up to some of the same problems as the U.S. Plus, it needs a place to dump its overproduction. The U.S. is great for that. We become the consumer of last resort. While China does have much more effective management of its uh, resources, you can't you can't deny that its primary node as the prime ground of, of production puts them at a weird capacity. Um, the United States, however, is still super productive, but only in finishing products are, are in very high quality uh, base of products, such as high quality steel, etc. So you have to ask yourself, you know, China wants to diversify its own background. It does not want to become the world's reserve currency, but it is increasingly a currency of trade. And that is weakening the dollar. Right. And a weak dollar was good for American production, but not right now when everything is shut down and we have supply chain backups. Just like, for example, a weak, a weak uh, yuan was good for Chinese production, but that is also no longer true. Thus, you see a stronger, and even in its internal dual currency system, a stronger yuan note within China itself. Um, I think you will see to something like a multi-reserve currency, which will still favor the U.S. a little bit. But what China and Russia actually want, um, logically, and to say China and Russia want anything is to talk about its it's, it's leadership. It's people who want a bunch of different things. Those are very varied areas like the United States. They have internal peripheries and external peripheries, etc. Don't take this generalization to apply to all of the in, in things to internal to either country. They have their own problems, and a lot of what they do have nothing to do with us. But in so much that their international policy is coherent, um, both Chinese and, and Russian policy is somewhat rational. They bucked dependence on U.S. development, unlike India and Brazil and whatnot, and thus are in a better place to stand independently. Uh, Russia, for obvious reasons, it was part of the USSR. Um, but uh, Russia still has a fairly weak economy. Um, uh, Michael Hudson was talking about Russia's ability to succumb to the United States. It does have massive energy reserves and thus sh should be doing better. But energy is actually becoming cheaper and cheaper because commodity prices decline. Oh, my sweet summer child. This is stupid. This is highly, highly dumb. Um, do not believe that states are moral actors ever. And do not believe that China is committed to building a unified global community based on green and equitable development. If that were true, why would China hide its negotiation terms? when it deals with African countries, even from every member of the country themselves, including the government. <sighs> See, this is what people get when people get their news sources from the left, what they think. They think there's good guys and bad guys. This is nonsense. China's solar is committed to destroy the Western fossil fuel industry. Uh, China burns more coal than the United States, but it realizes that if it continues to do so, it will be underwater. But Shanghai, by the way, is still predicted to be underwater. Its actions are totally consistent with a capitalist development program acting rationally. You don't correct belief in one State Department's bullshit by believing another person's State Department. Look at what they actually do. And get your information not from either Chinese nor American sources. On these issues, they have neither side has any ability or any reason to be accurate. Actually, what I would tell you to look at would be African sources. 
China is objectively a better global force than the United States. So what? Prussia was objectively Germany before World War One was objectively a better a better global force than Britain. That says nothing. Read African Financial News. Japan was objectively a better global force than the United States in East Asia and was seen by a lot of Stalinist actually as a defensible project, as a counter-imperialist force. You didn't want to be a Manchurian or a Korean under that regime, however. This is a nonsense way to think. It shows immaturity. Which African sources do you look at, kid? Of course, China is committed to economic development on fairer terms. It doesn't have the capacity to be unfair. It didn't survive a war in which twenty percent, in which fifty percent of the world's wealth was in two percent of its hands. You won't see a repeat of the American scenario. I've not said it's done debt trap diplomacy. Again, you're arguing against. You're arguing against something, somebody who, frankly, knows more about the situation than you. They're not doing debt trap diplomacy. If you want to get good reporting on this, read the China and Africa program. It makes China look a lot better than the West, but that doesn't... that Debt trap diplomacy is, is, is a myth, all right? China doesn't want... China doesn't want uh, these countries to default. And it's it, it it is truly committed on being a better a more fair uh with its with its engagement. I totally I, I, I'm not discrediting that. I don't want to sound like an anti-China stand. That's totally true. But what China is also committed to doing is growing its its productive forces and and while tamping down on certain elements of its bourgeoisie, there are billionaires in the Chinese party. They still have factions that are committed to capitalist development. The reason why China seems so impressive to us is because the West is so not. All right. Oh, actually, the Ugandan airport wasn't even claimed by the West. It was claimed by Ugandan people themselves. The West just didn't fact check the information. Again, probably should actually know where people are getting their misinformation from. Uh, yeah, China got its its policy of hiding the terms from Western banks, and thinks and thinks it would actually be at disadvantageous competition with other developed powers by doing that. But that tells you that it's not totally interested in um, fair and global development. It's interested in its own development. She does not come from the left of the Communist Party, and actually, if you knew the history of communism in China, you would not make that mistake. Xi's first act was to purge the neo-Maoists and then and the, the, purge the leadership of the neo-Maoists from Bo Lai from any position of power. He's also made an explicit commitment to maintaining um, a market, a market economy in the indefinite future. Why do you trust this shit, bro? Like, you're a person who comes from, okay, you're like, it's the shock of recognition problem. It's the same problem when, you know, like, the average PMC person goes railing off against the PMC, right? Because that's the people they know. You've only known misinformation about China from the West. They're not a nefarious country. You know, it, it, you're not you're not super unfree in general living in China. You're not free either. Um, but for example, the the Chinese victory. This is projection, though. We've seen this before. 
what would the forces of production to shut themselves around from the global trade economy be? They're literally the richest. They're literally the richest country in absolute terms of GDP in the next ten years. If they can't do it because world GDP has closed off, when must you think they'll ever be able to do it? Have you thought about that? Have you looked at these numbers? To fight effectively, you must give up your dreams. Oh, fuck off. Rashad literally worked for the Chinese government, dipshit. Get off my wall. Also, I mean, I say that because uh, uh, Prashad's earlier work is actually highly critical of China. I'm sorry, I shouldn't probably tell you to get off the wall, but you, you you have very selective sources that you should really do some background research into. What you should actually, if you want to trust people in China, don't trust don't trust people who work for Chinese universities who've given a special grant. Get his, get sources from actual Chinese actual Chinese sources. The the picture you will get from that is all of it. Let me tell you how uh, visas work in China. If you publish anything that really goes against the government, you won't get one. And he works at a Chinese university. I know many Sinologists who are exiled in Korea because, not because they were, many of them were Maoist, my friend. They were, they were dedicated Maoists, but they published something critical on the current Chinese line and they lost their visa status. It is not surprising that Rashad's own historical work has changed given where he works. Don't read any. Oh my God. Honestly, no. But someone's asked me, should you try to work for China too? Is he not to be trusted? Depends on what he's talking about. Vijay Prashad's very, very accurate on his development of the rest. All right. Michael Hudson's very, very accurate on what U.S. I mean, he used to work for a conservative think tank, a future think tank. He, he's very, very accurate on this description of what Western dollar diplomacy is on. You can't trust everybody on everything, however. And instead of having silly Manichaean notions about you, who you should trust totally on this and that, you should read a diverse array of sources. Furthermore, you should look at the actual development what's going on. Do you know what a Gini coefficient is? What is a Gini coefficient in China? 
you're triggering me because you're not you're triggering me because this is because this is a hard thing to to handle. You are taking one discredited set of sources and then reading another person's statements as if it is 100% accurate without looking at what would be motivating those statements. You can't be selectively critical. All right. That's how what got us in trouble in the first place. Here's what I'm going to tell you. First off, China is a highly complicated society with internal factions that are not really non-opaque to us because it is not in Chinese uh, domestic policy interest for foreigners to completely understand the tensions within China's development itself. Two, just because someone has a relationship to someone and has an incentive not to totally tell them all, all one side of things does not mean you should discredit all of their work. This is also true for people who work for U.S., for U.S. staff who write on China. Often they are right. It is better to hit your enemies with the truth than with a lie. This is why you can trust. The, I, frankly, RT was often a good, a good set of news on stuff going on in America. It's a terrible set of news for stuff going on in Russia. All right? Truth hurts your enemies more than lies do. The Gini coefficient... Um, is not an ideal state, but it is it is interesting to look at what it's done in China. China, and G in particular, has lowered the Gini coefficient. When G started, the Gini coefficient was higher in China than the U.S. All right. Uh, China has, depending on which source you read from China's own numbers, China's gotten it down to about 30, between, uh, I've, seen, I've seen the Gini coefficient as low as 38, some as high as 48. But that means that it's now gotten rural poverty to about U.S. levels, which is amazing for a developing world nation. All right. Look at India, where the Gini coefficient is likely insane or Guatemala. All right. Um, but it is not uh, anything like anything that was even imagined under the communist society. Furthermore, if you talk to people like Don Huang uh, or people who have come out of China, who who actually are are many of them are dedicated Maoists, they, they, they actually point down that this developmental process was actually really bad for the rural area of the peasantry. And what Xi has done is try to stabilize some of the internal instability by re-spreading that wealth out. But he didn't, Xi did not even adopt the reforms promised by Hu Jintao in his debates with the Neo-Maoists in, in 2007. So it's to say that Xi comes from the left of the Communist Party is not entirely true. He basically comes from the from the center left of it, but he's also, in another way, a total Confucian reformer, and that he believes that you should also reinvigorate China's national culture and the specific Han character of it. To say that it is rectifying inequality when its GDP is going down is actually kind of funny. One, who and Ji aren't on the same faction. Two, yes, because Zhang Jimin was a billionaire. But three, who whose major debates and Ji's were with the Neo Maoists, which were the actual left of the common turn. All right. The problem that people have in the West is they think that China wants to be a world hegemon. It doesn't. It is not even that dedicated to, to global fair competition, honestly. It's not trying to overthrow a capitalist order. It's just trying to play at it more fairly because it's in its benefit to do so. It's also in its benefit for social stability for it not to have the kind of inequality that the United States has. We should all give China a pat on the back for that for capitalist power. But if you believe that is socialism, you don't know what socialism is. Um, there's a good book on the neo Maoist debates. I would also tell you to pick up um, the debates between the Kyle Collective and the and, and Swang, which are different things. <laughs> 
the GDP is unsustainable, period, and we can't... I mean, it's... Oh, so here's the problem with GDP. It's a very shitty uh, aggregator of general profit margins, but it actually is the only one we have. And what you see is as, as countries develop, GDP just drops. It just, you know, the, the higher developed the country... Uh, the faster the GDP drops. That actually totally makes sense because uh, gross domestic product would drop as the country is more developed. Um, uh, there's a good book. Some of that asked me, do I have any email? Uh, send me a private message sometime and I'll get you to this. One thing I will say though is don't, just because I have these criticisms of China doesn't mean you should trust Western sources at all. All right. Um, they've been misstating things all over the place. Um, and it actually tells you how desperate they are in the competition with China in some ways, because if they, in earlier times, they actually tended to hit things swung. Um, they actually tended to say things that were true about Chinese development. Now they seem to just be making stuff up it means they don't have a lot of truth to hit them with. Furthermore, um, the fact that that Chinese labor unrest is, is, is still at odds with the communist party itself. And Neo Maoist will admit this, um, uh, is it does tell you some of the stakes at hand, but if you're getting your information from red sales, no, you're, you're basically trusting someone who's highly, it's like trusting. You can't trust anyone who has a tie to a state to be honest about that state. You also can't, I mean, like, my God. Furthermore, um, what China seems to be doing and what Russia seems to do is establishing zones of economic, prospect, uh, economic hegemony within themselves. And this is perfectly rational for large powers to do, right? Um But but the idea, for example, that, that there aren't tensions between, say, Russia and China misses, for example, the exact thing we're talking about is like issues over Siberia, issues between China and India. Those are not just ideological issues. Those are also economic ones. Everyone says they're independent. Look where their funding comes from. My funding comes from you guys, so... And it doesn't take a lot to fund this. Oh getting tired and i still have other stuff to talk about let's talk about legal defensiveness i was not expecting to get into this weird cul-de-sac on china i'm doing a whole episode on china where i'm going to have to praise it for what it's done right i mean you want to talk about what it's done right um g has undone a lot of the the damage dung did to the rural populations and g has been better at uh tamping down on the worst excess of uh, excess of the chinese capital all right, he has. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, G, however, is also very interested in culture war issues and developing a kind of culture based on even Straussian lines. But that'd be Leo Strauss. Um, furthermore, G has issues with the ties between India and China. Uh, um, so. Uh, there are all kinds of strategic issues. You need to be a realist about this when you approach this. By that I mean, like, we, we should all admit that compared to Western developmentalism, particularly as the U.S. took it over, but in, in general, that um, that China is a much more humane actor. It just is. It just it just is. Right. Um, there there when when you ask me. Uh, yeah, he is. If you ask me about these ideas 
China uses the world market to get rid of its overproduction for its commitment to full employment. Yeah, but it can't not do that forever. That's that that's just proving that you're developed into a purely capitalist relation. And in which case, fine, but just own it. You know, the most people I talk to who have any ties to the to Chinese government, and I've taught a lot of these a lot of Chinese diplomats' kids, by the way. Like I I'm not talking out of my ass. Um, will tell you that they need to do this to eventually cut the funds off. But it's like when I talk to, um, is Strauss train really that influential? It's influential in part of the foreign policy development of the Politburo. Again, it is wrong to see China as a monolithic nation, either in terms of its internal cultural development, its internal economic development, or its politics. Just like it is wrong to see the U.S. as a monolithic nation in any of those terms. After all, most of you are from the U.S. and you don't believe in that shit. But you also have to not pretend that there aren't class relations and stuff through all this. All this. Yeah, they absolutely do need full employment for internal stability forever. And that's that means that they're tied to the current system. And you can't blame them for that. The, the idea here is not to get you to think in terms of China as a bad actor. It is not. Right? It's not one thing. If someone tries to sell you on a unified theory of action on these nation states, they're trying to sell you a line. Ask why they're doing that. In some cases, the answer is immediately clear. Yeah, if, yes, but that doesn't mean anything. Yes, of course. This is absolutely true. We don't make relative statements like that. That is not that is not our our trajectory. So I'm going to read what it said here for people who are listening. China is not a monolith, but its trajectory is rising. Well, okay, and let's be careful on rising. As I said, from the standpoint of, of, of Africa, China is not rising. In fact, they see the Chinese economy as weakening. But they're from the standpoint of developing nation, which GDPs, if they're developing at all, are going through the roof because they're coming from nothing. China's GDP has been dropping for a decade and a half, but it's perfectly consistent with what you would think with a developed capitalist country with a strong sector. And they're navigating that better than the West ever did. That is totally true. All right. Is it kinder to its people than the U.S.? It depends on which people. For the majority of people, I'd say, yeah, but not for all of them. That's true for any national project and national system. And what you see in, the, in China is the development of trying to develop a, a, a nation that is carved out of a bunch of historical empires into a coherent nation. What you saw in Russia, it's also carved out of a bunch of historical empires. And the United States really is the first bourgeois empire. I mean, that's its origins. But to believe that just because you don't fix a lie by inverting it any more than these post leftists believe that by inverting globalism, you should start investing in nationalism. All right. The, the, the neoliberal globalization project was not actually a weakening of the state at all. In fact, it empowered it. Oh, my God, on zero COVID. I see why you guys are into MMT because you're basically a Salian socialist. And if I had my way, I'd put you up against the wall. That's not that's not me exaggerating either. I was going to talk about the need to be non-sectarian and forgiving. Uh, but... I mean, 
yeah. China's COVID policies are obviously better than the Americas, but let's also say that that objectively speaking, they hid the existence of COVID in the beginning, and you cannot forget that. They don't even deny that now. So this idea that you can use, I mean, this idea that you can just trust single powers and something like that just doesn't hold water. Nor does it make sense to go after and demonize China as a nation state any more than you would any other nation state. The thing is, you have to look at it for what it does, good when it's good and bad when it's bad. And there are plenty in both directions. If you have a single unitary view, I'm not going to... This is a good question. Globalization was actually dependent on public resources being used to create unregulated but private mar- or semi-regulated but private markets, but doing so at an advantage to the nations at hand. So labor arbitrage was actually expanded during this time period, meaning that states were not allowed to strengthen their working class if they wanted to do trade with the U.S. And thus... They did so at it at the risk of, of their own economic development, often in ways that curtailed them from other markets. So we have to ask ourselves, like, what does this mean, right? Like, get back to this question I'm trying to answer all of you at once. Oh, and globalization strengthening the state. So this meant that all this was dependent on a couple of things. One... The uh, globalized world was totally okay with even giving at least superficially China favored nation status. So the idea that it was somehow uh, disadvantaged in regards to the world system always struck me as interesting. But it got favored nation status, hoping it would play along better than it did. You saw those relations sour in the 2000s. Um, And it really soured under Obama more than under Xi. Xi actually tamps down on anti-U.S. sentiment when it gets too high. So what, what you see as the use of, of legal establishments in the international trade system to strengthen the individual states and individual bourgeoisie within those states, but those states also replied on tamping down of elements within the state itself. So, for example, you were, you were, you had an, during the neoliberal period, you had a strong incentive to tamp down on the regulatory power of the state or any power of the state internal to itself domestically, but also at making sure the state was strong abroad. And setting up uh, international trade things, et cetera. This is why during the neoliberal period, you saw the most investment and acceptance of not only the military, but military Keynesianism. Which also meant that the kind of de facto, uh, the reason why the developing world had issues historically isn't because they're dumber or have or have any less labor power. Um, it's that they were overexploited, one, but even more so, As in uh, John Smith's book, Imperialism, neoliberal powers are able to use legal arbitrage to make sure that their local their local um, workers could not develop. And they even did this with the help of some, frankly, uh, quote unquote, socialist societies in the 80s and 90s. Um, the U.S. was the biggest benefiter of the Sino-Soviet split, and uh, the Sino, the, the the Chinese in the non-aligned movement would actually would often support very reactionary governments. Um, so 
this this whole thing um it's 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 to think of this in terms of china good us bad is n- neither one of the states are actually in our interest in so much that that the development of china is into more human capitalism which we hope for two things one the normalization between china and the us and china just accepting i mean the us just accepting that china is an equal partner if not a superior partner in global development and two Actually, looking at what the Europeans do, because one thing that was pointed out by by my interview by my interviews with people in the China Africa project is that the U.S. is actually not that invested in Africa, except in, in military strategic terms. It doesn't actually do that much, even imperialistically. Um, it's not the person making loans to African countries, except for ones that it did way long ago in the seventies. All right, so. The U.S. has also, in many ways, just accepted its hegemony is really in what it sees its, its, as its, its transatlantic super polity with Europe and in Latin America. And it has pivoted to Asia because of its fears of Asia breaking down its ability to have a transatlantic super, super polity. But that's breaking down anyway. How much is the right interest in having a th- pretty, I mean, what, what you see a lot of rightists who actually idolize China, including far rightists, because of their ability to wield state power. And because their um, civic sector is not deracinated in large, China, China's general public, I would say the average Chinese person believes in the Chinese government. You cannot say for anyone in any of the Western developed countries. Um, the average reactionary in the, in, in the United States would love to have that ability to will the status quo. Sometimes they think they can do it by hostility to China. Sometimes they think they can do it by emulating it. That's what this national conservative turn seems to be partially about. But also that's why like the Democrats are always looking to start some new Cold War or somebody. But here, here's what, here, what I would say U.S. mostly bad. But again, even that's uh, somewhat misleading. That's it. When I say the CIA is not even a bourgeois organization, what I mean is it doesn't really have a clear class character. It has a character in the nation to the state. In so much that it is subservient to the bourgeois state, it is a bourgeois thing. But internal to the United States and what its function is within the United States, it does not have a clear class function. It just doesn't. It's not really what it's concerned with. These things really are important to understand. The, uni- the CIA is not interested in doing the work of just any bourgeoisie. It's interested in doing the work of of the intelligence apparatus with the military, which is generally in the interest of a certain sector of the bourgeoisie, but not all of it. Do you see Biden uh, call South America our front yard? Yep. And that's, that's a continuation of the Monroe doctrine, which, which we need to also be honest. I think Daniel Besner's got on this point that, uh, the Monroe doctrine means that isolationism was always, isolation except for here and here being the entirety of the western of the of our hemisphere and actually not just our hemisphere but also the one immediately beneath us um what you are seeing is the development so of each of these nations basically operating under a monroe doctrine and you'll see that develop even more it, it should scare us What you may be entering is, uh, I want to talk to Michael Hudson because I want to ask him if he thinks we're entering from a time of super imperialism. And he means something different than by that than it's historically meant. But his, but he actually accepts the historical definition that capitalist powers will not do anything other than bomb each other. They will not try to occupy each other. They can't do it. It's not effective. You don't fight imperialism by an alter imperialism, though. People tried that for, th- for for 300 years. They tried it against the British Empire. That's what led to the United States. Um, I think that Biden's going to try to wave Iran sanctions, but it's not going to have a whole lot of effect at this point because the Iranian government has no incentive to trust us. We seem too unstable politically. Sanctions never do, rarely ever do good. In fact, sometimes sanctions actually create 
Uh, they actually hurt American economic interests, believe it or not. So when I say that Kalski's imperial, what I was going to ask him, Hudson, though, is he think if we think we're we're entering from super imperialism back to imperialism, where capitalist forces will attack each other, I don't think we are. But I would be interesting if we are there, because because it does seem like there's increasing tension between different capitalist forces. And here I'm not even bracketing China. We're going to bracket China out for a second. We're too obsessed with that anyway. Look at the differences between um, Russia and the U.S. No one's going to argue that Russia is a socialist state that has any brains. But um, uh, and we're also, I would say that everything that Russia does is perfectly rational and it's uninterested and not particularly aggressive. But I will say to pretend that it's just defensive misses stuff like it running um, war games off of the Irish coast to scare Ireland, which is not an, uh, which is a neutral country in real life today, though. So it's not just picking sides against people who are clearly its enemies. Uh, sanctions, yeah, tend to consolidate elite power, which tells you what they're not really aimed at getting rid of elite power. You're absolutely correct. Well, this is... Uh, I'm getting weak. All this is to go back to the legal defensiveness argument, though. Everything is viewed in terms of state and law, but nation states are not... Nation states are are not classes. There are no such things as proletarian nations. Unless those nations had no class divisions. And there aren't any nations without class divisions. So this is the key point. Um, Russia has a very unorganized foreign policy because Russia does not have a clear economic um, the economic grounding that China does, it just doesn't. Um, and uh, this is something that I actually listened to a Michael Hudson interview recently, and I, I love Hudson, but he was he was like presenting Russia as it was a, a similar kind of power to China, and while it, it does have power and like its regional sphere of influence, like Lithuania and Latvia, etc., it, it, it is not like anything like China. It doesn't have the productive capacity anymore. <laughs> the comment, oh my god. It didn't matter when it did. The name of the party, or, or, or if someone has socialism in their constitution, is absolutely meaningless. It doesn't mean a damn thing. Israel is not just created by a socialist. Oh, no. Israel is not just created by a socialist party. It was created with imperature of a socialist state, meaning that the first person to recognize it was Stalin's Russia. I bet you didn't know that. Stalin recognized it under his interpretation of the national plan when the Jewish Autonomous Zone and the USSR did not work. <laughs> the flip of the U.S. and, and Israel became uh, became a policy of the late 50s, early 60s, and had to do with um, shifting strategic orientations in the Arab world. Not anything ideological whatsoever. Do I think the USSR was socialist? Uh, no. In so much that it had class divisions, no. Was it attempting lower state socialism? Yes. Would I call it state capitalism? Not really. Um, to view this in terms of nations and impute them as, like, 
to view like people like oh monetary sovereignty is a spectrum okay fine it is but then so is socialism in which case the ussr would have been on the very low end of that spell with with almost no existing state even really on that scale in so much that it both has production for surplus value and classes and classes which are reified over time and in fact this was a big issue um in china in the 1950s when this was brought up um in uh uh, the the Thousand Flowers period, in which case Mao then suppressed it and it was brought up again in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, socialism is not the first phase of communism and Marx, even in, even in the way that it's phrased in the Critique of the Goethe program, that's only used there. Again, maybe you should read the primary sources And read them in the original language, not with the biases you bring to it into it. Do you think the ICC functions in the American uh, NATO hegemony? Uh, I think... Um, that's actually a, a very interesting... Very interesting question that I'm going to have to think about for a second. I mean, I'm assuming you're not asking about the International Cricket Conference. By the way, do you have any content on Israel Power Center more broadly on settler colonialism? Um, settler colonialism, the best the best person to read on that is Gerald Horn, if you're talking about before the American Revolution. Gerald Horn's writing on the American Revolution is all over the place, and not entirely on us. Um, but Gerald Horn's work on uh, on the colonial period, as is Brit as in Britain's later stuff, is actually quite good. Um, what would I tell you as far as the rest of it? Uh, do, 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 do. Um, Israel Palestine, there's lots of stuff on there. The thing is, Israel Palestine is like a major question, but it's also a question which I have very little hope. No, the International Court of Justice. Um, so what I'll tell you about the ICC on that now, before I was making sure you admit, um, and The Hague is that the International Criminal Court, um, is something that the West explicitly does not subject itself to. Um, so the U S the U S is a signatory to the universal declaration of human rights, although it's never, I mean, it signed it in the period of, uh, of, of, of Jim Crow segregation. So it's never lived up to it. Um, no nation, no nation on earth lives up to, uh, the conditions of the universal declaration of human rights. None of them do none of them. All right. But in so much that they did, the U S never signed into the ICC. So, so it was like the, um, a state of exception to itself. The, the the use of the ICC could never be used in the U.S. itself because it wasn't signatory to the process. So yes, you can hit. It's one of those things you hit people with truths, but don't suggest yourself to the same truths, right? It's the state of exception thing. Why do I have little hope on Israel Palestine? Because Palestine has no the the backers of Palestine have no incentive to really help its economic situation. That includes most of the Arab world. So all people can do is really hope. And the uh, Palestine as a vi as a viable two state solution is the, the, it, it's not it's not viable. So basically, all you're all you're really hoping for is that you don't see an ethnic cleansing. That's like the most optimistic scenario. Uh, the socialist revolution didn't happen in agrarian and poor countries either. What you had was bourgeois revolution. Most of those nations ended up being capitalist after their revolution, destroyed their peasantry. So again, it, it helps if you uh, if if you're going to make a dumb argument, you should actually make a correct dumb argument. Some, I, you know, I'm banning this dipshit. <laughs>
Is Cuba capitalist? Yeah, it's an attempt at socialism. It's also isolated. But again, attempt at and is are not the same thing. And whether or not Cuba could have, could, accum could accumulate socialism is another question. It doesn't have the material capacity to do it. It's an island. Its ability to hold out for as long as it is, it's kind of a miracle. And Cuba is one of the few social states I will completely stand. I don't have a lot of criticism for, except in the 1980s and 1990s when it was doing somewhat desperate things to the indigenous population uh, off of fears about AIDS. And some of it did then isn't really particularly forgivable, but in general, it has not done that. But what people attempt, what people mean, isn't the important thing. This is why this is why the, the developing world socialism thesis has never really held out. Most of the most of the national liberation movements were socialist, saw themselves as socialist uh, things. What they got in almost all cases was capitalist development because they got stuck. And the places where they didn't get stuck, Cuba was one of them. They had they had the USSR to buoy up their their raw resources. Like whether or not you think the USSR was truly socialist or not, or this, that, and the other, these stage theories that you've gotten, and then you come against me against the primary sources, I want you to actually look at what happened. Cuba is literally this scenario in which you don't see that. Vietnam is the other defensible scenario, but the, Vietnam, unlike Cuba, liberalized. And do you know, do you know what, the, what the riots in Cuba this year were over? The end of the dual currency system and its liberalization into the national market. But that was the funny thing about the whole thing, right? Like the protests in Cuba were about Cuba's government liberalizing. And this communist started defending them because, you know, I, I don't know, you know, defend the Cuban government because, of course, it's embargoed in this, and it's a shit situation and we should be defending it. But also we should have been honest about what it was doing and why it was having protests in the first place. Otherwise, you have a communist road to capitalism, which is what most of those national revolutions ended up being. I don't think you're an asshole. <laughs> oh, Miles. Miles. I'm going to use your name for a second. You just haven't been used to how I engage with people. If we were talking now, I would not be this passionate about you. That's totally true. Yeah, they were. They were giving government to, to a pair of them. Uh, like, the Cuban government's good and stuff. It was used by Western propaganda means, but it did come from a legitimate place. And what I saw is we didn't talk about this, nor did we talk about the resolution. Because the resolution did wasn't good for either, you know, for either side either. I mean, you know, the, like the Cuban government's not this totalitarian hellscape. It's also a place though, where they can't always get hypodermic needles. I mean, and and one has to say, like, it's been a, it's been, a, they, you know, someone was talking to me about the Cuban socialist sector, and I was like, yeah, of course. They can spend a majority amount of their GDP on welfare because they have an internal coherent economy, except when they need external goods. And then they have to get USD to get that. <laughs> like, th this isn't the, cri and this is not to criticize Cuba. Like I said, the, the criticisms of Cuba that are legitimate are like what it did to gay people in the 70s and 80s. That's real and that's fair. Um, uh, some of its some of its concessions to uh, to the USSR are probably not in the benefit of some people, which even Che Guevara said, by the way. Um, che Guevara complained a lot about Russian and Chinese chauvinism. Um, this is not often read because we want to have a very clean view of the of Soviet history. Um, but another so 
so those are issues that it has. But um, uh, local democracy there is actually pretty vibrant on a local level. Um, that's that's true. Uh, um, but it is but a Margo state. It can do a lot with education. I mean, it's 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 kind of a miraculous state in a lot of ways. Um, but it is stuck. And it's had trouble even trying to form trade blocks with other socialist countries because other socialist countries have asked it to liberalize parts of its economy. And socialist here is nominal, but I'm just putting that out there. That's a real problem. It wasn't the U.S. asking uh, Cuba to end its current exchange rate and the flow of its currency. It was not. And that wasn't from the embargo either. The embargo makes it hard for it to get USD to buy things that it needs. And it's totally an unjustifiable embargo. But that doesn't change who was asking it to do what. And I, I you know, but if you want to talk about like a model for um, uh, for socialism in a way that's handled it in a way in a way that's a lot better than for example Venezuela which is still stuck in a single commodity socialist problem and it, it's been a nightmare for it um Cuba is a better place to look but in most cases particularly if you look at like the national liberation movements in Africa etc they ended up with capitalist governments subsumed to the capitalist system because they didn't have another way to get the stuff they need and um I I I, I think we have to like in these are these are not resource like raw resource poor countries at all. These aren't countries with low GDP relative to the development either. But they didn't have a choice. That was always the problem. That is the paradox of any kind of national socialist project. You gonna talk to anyone on South South? I want to get someone on South Asia on. I want to get someone to talk about why there's so many tensions between Vietnam and China still. Because ideologically, it doesn't make that much sense. So what's driving that is something else. Yeah, uh, the embargo predates, correct, it predates Cuba's communi communism. It was just maintained because of it. Let's talk about the legal strategy stuff, because that's what I want to talk about. I got into it a little bit, and we got sidetracked on these uh, domestic issues and over the definition of socialism. Uh, it's not just USAID to Vietnam. There's other stuff driving that. Vietnam asked for the aid. Uh, I'm going to yell at you. <laughs> because developmental, like... Marx actually does talk about the problems with developmentalism in uh, letters where he said that Russia didn't necessarily have to have to uh, go through a capitalist revolution, which is not the not the the, the um, position that Plekhanov or Lenin took. Um, Marx actually takes that explicitly in his letter to Zurich, but he but it, we do have to say that he wasn't saying it could do it from nothing. He said it was able to if if there were socialist parties in the West or even Western development that would work would enable them to not have to go through the capitalist transition, um, which is why Lenin was able to kind of argue in Marx um, indirectly. Although those letters were also not publicly available when Lenin was around. Um, so, yeah. Um, to say it's culturally ingrained though is both true, but you have to look at why it's culturally ingrained. There are material reasons for why cultural stuff happens. So there are still tensions between the two countries that are material. Um, some of it has to do with the fact that the empires that used to occupy China also beat the shit out of uh, of, uh, of Vietnam. Um, it also has to do with the fact that in the Sino-Soviet split, um, the Chinese communists sided with the Khmer Rouge and the West against Vietnam. Which is it's not make anyone look good. Uh, but the law. Law is not a is not a class neutral organ, and that's what was my point earlier. It's just not. So dependence on the law and the left to do what you want it to do is always going to be at your disadvantage. So this is why all these calls for like de facto or de jure censorship and all that or any of that is a little bit sketchy, and particularly in a capitalist state. 
Um, if you're siding with a faction of the bourgeois against another faction of the bourgeois, you must know that it will be used against you immediately. Now, some people think this is a willing west to take because they're basically they basically think the state of exception favors them. But I, I want you to look at the political landscape and, and tell yourself that the progressive parts of the bourgeoisie are favoring socialism right now. Ugh. So the legal strategy stuff is a real limitation because it can seem like it's allowed for a lot of... I've even seen a Marxist I respect say that, oh, you know, all social progress in the United States has come from the executive branch and specifically from the for our, from the judicial branch. And I just think this is nuts. Like, um, uh, but what, what diffusion of power has done, uh, no, well, I'm not arguing about it. I said, I said it doesn't work tactically either. Um, so anyone who talks about your free speech is largely, uh, in the current environment, is largely doing so as a bait and switch. I mean, like, if you look at what the right actually does with free speech, they don't believe in it remotely. Um, look at what they're doing with school boards and all these laws and speech codes and all this. They're doing everything that they accuse the left of doing. You know, if you want a legal right to use private platforms, then you're going to need a legal right to use private platforms, and you should probably make them public anyway. Um a good argument for that to be done with social media but that also comes with its own downsides which is the temptation of any gov electoral government to use it to favor itself temporarily in time the, 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 there are always book burnings man there's book burnings when I was a kid too I was actually telling someone about this there's some Baptist book burning where they burnt my copy of Anne Rice's uh um, well, my mom's copy of Anne Rice's interview with a vampire that I loaned to somebody. It's not new. Not remotely new. Anyway. So, you know, the free speech is... Uh, the 13th Amendment was recognizing where the conditions were as much as it was. Yeah, exactly. So I want you to, to to just have that in your mind when you think that we're going to be able to use legal fiat to help us. And I, and I just think either way, it's just not a, it's, it's not a useful strategy. It's a conservative strategy. The reason why unions use law is because it's the only thing they have. But it's basically just asking the bourgeois to play by their own rules. That's like a status. It's like, look, there's this thing in the famous crow that you agree to. You must play by it. And yeah, fine. If you, that's the weapon you got, that's the weapon you got. But it's a defensive weapon. That's all it can ever be. All right. On that note, I'm getting tired. I shouldn't have done two hours. Uh, hey, Miles. I'm glad you were here today, actually. Thank you. Yeah. I don't need people to just agree with me, even though I get all bitchy. <laughs> That's one of the things. Neighborhood revolution. Yeah, I agree with you. On that. Like, People should study Cuba more, really. I, I do think that's a fair... I also think... I mean, yeah, the, 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 there are there are black spots in Cuba's history. Like, it's not perfect um, by any stretch of the imagination. We shouldn't pretend it is. But uh, but it's probably one of the, the best things we got as far as, like, a model for for thing. If, if we could... If it could have existed in a, in a less... If the party could have expanded its its uh, it could have trusted in its facilities to expand its internal democracy upwards, it would have been better. But that's that's hard to imagine in the situation that it was in, um, particularly when it had to deal with the model of the Soviet Union. One question: uh, What's your take on Sanya Faber's Cuba Since the Revolution book? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> I totally agree with the idea that you should just allow to get what they want. That hasn't been available for like 15 years. I, I, I agree with you. That's the only strategy. That, like if you go to a union rep now, I, I say this as a person in a union, right? 
um, you know what they're going to tell you? They're going to have you talk to their lawyer. That's the strategy they have. Like uh, unions are work are work action averse in most cases, particularly public sector unions, because they're afraid of the political fallout. Uh, is there any way to get an MFA style education without uh, a good book group and um, and uh, YouTube? I'm <laughs> honestly for real. Uh, but what you don't get from the MFA style education that way is the connections, because that's what it's really about. Hey, Zach, you can still do it. You just have to go through Mexico. They'll take you. You can totally do it. Go from Merida. Don't tell me how I know. All right. Oh, I'm so tired. I got worked up. Um, so my book's coming out from Terry Tuts Press. We're going to be doing a lot more stuff. I'm, I'm going to take a break for these plague talks. <laughs> um, <laughs> see you later. <laughs>